Yakuza 0, a game that released back in 2015 on the PS3 and PS4 in Japan, which then later came to just the PS4 in 2017 everywhere else. It then later became the first Yakuza game to come to PC and Xbox, being released in 2018 for PC, with it later coming to Xbox in 2020. Although the team had previously released games on Xbox and PC, such as a couple of Super Monkey Ball games, and their first title they made after rebranding their studio to RGG Studio, being a game called Binary Domain, which came out on PS3, Xbox 360, and PC back in 2012. However, this is completely irrelevant to Yakuza, but I thought to bring it up anyway. But speaking of 2020, despite the game coming out in 2015, it wasn't until basically 2020 that this game became the resurgence for the franchise's popularity in the West. As you may know, the performance of the series in the West was definitely dwindling over time, and although we still got games like Yakuza 6 and Judgment, which were much newer games, Yakuza 0 very easily became the most popular game in the franchise amongst us Westerners. Whether or not it's as popular around here as it is in Japan, I don't know, but it was thanks to this game that I even know about the series. Around the time though of its original release, regardless of how well it did, there was a pretty high chance that you might be confused about the release schedule of these games. It really didn't help that in the West we got Yakuza 0, a prequel, then about half a year later we got Kiwami, a remake of the first game, then once again a bit over half a year later we got Yakuza 6, which continued from 5 and not Kiwami or 0. So back before I had any understanding of these games, I felt very confused that they seemingly released like two games every year, but then when 0 shot up in popularity, everything started to become quite clear. Anyway, let's talk about the gameplay. The game features four fighting styles, just like the previous game Ishin did, but this time it actually has eight because you can play as two characters. You play as Kiryu, and for the second time but first time in a proper brawler, you can play as fan favorite Goro Majima. They're both contained within their own areas, with Kiryu being in the classic Kamurocho and Majima being in the slightly less classic but still classic Sotenbori. The game is also, again, a prequel being set in the 1980s, which means there's plenty of very 80s things like this go dancing, but it also means we get to play as these lads in their 20s, as opposed to them being old farts like they normally are. Considering it was set during a big economic bubble of Japan, there's a lot of money that is being thrown around all the time to quite an exaggerated degree. This ties into gameplay as whenever you smack around enemies, money will always be flying around everywhere, which is both very satisfying and very useful. The money's used for buying stuff, as you would expect, but it's also essentially a replacement for XP, as you use money to purchase upgrades. Given how much money you have, you have significantly more freedom in messing around with things on the side, more than you do in the other games. However, a sort of interesting aspect of it is deciding whether or not you use your money on buying stuff or on upgrading, but because of how much money you get and the price of things, a lot of the time it doesn't really play out that way. This game also has a unique mechanic relating to heat, where instead of having one big long bar that you can expand by adding additional little segments, you have three bars of heat. And while heat is fairly easy to gain, it is incredibly easy to lose. If you stand still for about three seconds, it'll just immediately vanish from existence. However, many of the game's abilities revolve around which of the three bars you're currently in. Some only activate in the first bar, some only in the third, or some might be in the second and third, so on and so forth. Another thing affected by which bar you're in is your combo speed. This is something that I just call the gear mechanic, which is based off of a little accolade you get for defeating enemies in the first, second, or third gear. So in first gear, your combo speed is very slow, and then in third gear, your combo speed is how it should be. With all that explanation now out of the way, let me point out to everyone that even though I love Yakuza 0, I still think that how heat works with everything surrounding it is the worst mechanic in the whole franchise. Heat drains so laughably fast, like I said, and it'll also drain even more if you get hit, meaning that you have to be constantly attacking enemies in order to actually have combo speed. But instead of your combo speed starting at first gear and getting faster, it basically starts at third gear and then gets slower and slower as you go down. So if you want to use a heat action to deal some damage, you're now going to have to attack much slower. Basically, the game boils down to just spamming attacks until you can eventually start using your abilities. And while some of the styles have things to compensate for that, some really don't. Other styles also don't get any good abilities until the end of the skill trees, which means for your average playthrough, you won't have the insanely overpowered drunken brawler abilities where you can just counterhook the toughest enemy in the game and they lose a million health. But some good low heat abilities you can get are things like Majima's guard in the first bar when in Thug Style can't be broken, and he'll gain heat whenever he blocks attacks. But then Thug Style also doesn't have access to a counter unless you're in the third bar. What happens a lot of the time with that is that while you're waiting to counter someone, your heat drains, meaning you can't counter anymore and you have to just slap someone if you want to counter again. Then Kiryu's Beast and Rush Style in the first and second gear can't really do much unless you pick up a weapon with Beast or have all the late abilities with Rush. So while you can stunlock with Rush, you have to get some of the later abilities, such as ones that make it that evading doesn't just reduce all of your heat, which is 
a thing that happens for some reason. While none of these mechanics are really a problem once you get all of the abilities in the game, it is just goddamn annoying for when you're playing through the game for the first time, and I remember all I ended up doing with Kiri was just swinging wildly with Brawler until I found a bike, then I'd swing wildly and Beast, or with Majima, I would just spin around and break it. Besides that though, the story is definitely one of the best in the franchise. In all honesty, I would say it's the second best, but that's just me. In terms of progressing through it, it isn't like 4 or 5 where you play through a character's part, then never get to play as them again until the very end. Instead, you swap between Kiryu and Majima every two chapters, meaning that you're constantly progressing as both of them at an even rate. Their stories are also mostly their own, however, as you progress, you'll start to notice that things that happen in Kiryu's story are affecting Majima's, and vice versa. Although, unlike 4 or 5, the characters never meet in the story besides a little post credit scene which purely exists as some obvious fan service. The characters, the writing, the setting, the plot, it's all very expertly done and contains so many moments that'll keep you on the edge of your seat wanting more and more. It still has a lot of the tropes of other games, but rather than creating predictable moments like they often do, they instead create some scenes where you, you definitely feel some heavy emotions. I won't spoil things too much, but it expands on the story of the whole series, in particular the first game, in a way that is very appealing to fans of the series, as well as very interesting for people who want to get into it. Two characters that massively benefit from this expansion are Majima and Nishiki. Nishiki wasn't Ishin technically, but he hadn't actually been in a single Yakuza game since the first one. In the first one as well, he's buddy-buddy with Kiryu for three minutes before he goes, hey, I'm evil now, which means that you never really got any time to really give a shit about him betraying you. But in Zero, goddamn, you will end up loving him. He also received a facelift where instead of looking like a very evil guy who is evil with his witch nose and his intimidating aura, he looks a lot more friendly and lovable, which is exactly what he is. He plays a very pivotal role in the plot of Kiryu's section and may or may not show up at some point in Majima's. Speaking of, Majima and Yakuza 3 started to show a side that previously hadn't existed, where he is very serious and isn't some kooky, wacky little fella. This side of him sort of showed itself in Yakuza 4 and 5, but only a little bit. Then in Ishin, Majima received a facelift, as before he looked like an actual zombie for whatever reason, but now in Zero we get to see the true Majima, the one who's angry at the world for throwing so much shit at him, but he makes the most of it by trying to give two big, massive middle fingers to the world, although through the events of Zero, he kind of struggles to even do that. He's so fed up with everything that he wonders why he even bothers, but throughout the game you see him grow as a person, and that's not because good things happen to him like you'd expect. Oh, no, nothing good ever happens to Majima and Zero, but that just adds to the depth of his narrative. Now, let's put aside the story and talk about another absolutely flawless thing with Yakuza Zero its soundtrack. I do not exaggerate when I say that every song in this soundtrack is a banger, from the battle themes, to the cutscene music, even to the songs that play in minigames. All eight fighting styles have their own unique theme, there's one universal boss theme, six unique boss themes, and there's five but technically seven long battle themes. But now here's the crazy thing, every regular battle theme, every long battle theme, and all but one of the boss themes were all done by one guy, Hidden Ori Shoji. This isn't too surprising for some games, like how Yoko Shimomura does like every Kingdom Hearts song, but for the Yakuza games, they slowly start Started utilizing the talents of more and more composers to further diversify the sounds. Despite the fact that it was just one guy, he still managed to make each song stand out on their own. But he didn't stop there, because he did a bunch of other music too. He actually did most of the songs for Yakuza 0. Shoji consumed the most powerful musical steroids in the world when working on Yakuza 0, because every song he made was incredible. They genuinely all stand out from each other, which is just crazy to me, because you'd expect at some point for there to at least be two songs to sort of blur together, you know? And yet they don't. On top of this, the game features a lot of different composers to a degree that's greater than usual, meaning that the soundtrack sounds even more varied and every song sounds even more unique. Again, even the songs in the minigames, like the disco songs for example, absolutely slap. There is quite an obvious reason why even after so many years, Yakuza 0 still remains as some of the most played songs on the Sega Sound Team Spotify page. Now then, one final thing I'd like to mention is the reason as to why this game stood out so much more than games before it. Obviously being the first PS4 Yakuza game in the West and being the first PC and Xbox title for the series, definitely helped to expand sales. However, this was basically treated as a last hurrah for the games in the West. Sega in Japan basically said, Oh fine, we won't make the Americans localize Ishin, but we'll make this game much more appealing to you. This could be seen with some real world stuff being more recognizable by Western audiences, such as a sub-story with parody characters of Michael Jackson and Steven Spielberg, but another thing that made it popular was its localization. Now a lot of memes came about that made these games start to become more and more popular for us filthy English speakers, but then people looked into the memes and went, hang on, these games are actually good? It's not just a joke? And it's thanks to the localization that people were able to actually realize that. To explain 
explain it in a very short and concise way, a localization is basically like a translation, but rather than just translating all the Japanese words into English ones, the Japanese is instead essentially remade into English. But to explain a bit of the backstory of the localization for Yakuza 0, Yakuza 5's localization was supported by Sony, whereas previously it was all handled by Sega themselves. Yakuza 5's original localization was much better than the games that came before it. Maybe it was because Sony said, don't screw this up, or maybe it was because Sega said, let's not screw this up. I don't know the specifics, I don't work at either place, but still, 5's localization didn't have the charm that Yakuza 0's did. Yakuza 0 was then localized by Atlas USA, although... Technically, you could say it was still just Sega because Sega of America eventually acquired Atlas USA and then every Atlas USA employee became a Sega of America person. But regardless of whatever company represents the team, from zero and onwards, most of the people involved with that game's localization were all the same people. As with any team, some people eventually joined and others eventually left, but to list some of the names, there's Bill Alexander, Sam Mullen, Scott Stricker, John... Then, and these people were all part of the team that worked on the games from Zero to Lost Judgment. Although not all of them worked on all of them, because someone like Scott didn't do the remastered trilogy, for example. Now, there are definitely more people, but these people I just mentioned actually no longer work on the games. But it's not that it's a completely new team these days, as there are still a lot of people that worked on older games that recently worked on Like a Dragon Ishin and most likely Gaiden in November, like Josh Malone, for example. No relevance to Post Malone. I can't say if these ex Yakuza are completely hands off, though, as there may very well be instances of current staff asking those previous leads certain questions around the office, you know, the type of stuff like, hey man, is it Strichart or like Strikeheart? But with their background out of the way, I'd like to say that there's a very good reason that these localizers are very well respected amongst fans of the games. A lot of English localizations of games like to change a lot of things for seemingly no reason at all. Some very common things include changing the context or meaning behind certain scenes, or just twisting dialogue in such a way that a character might be portrayed very differently. Sometimes localizers make slight changes to things that end up being for the better, like when there might be some weird and creepy shit that happens, or making a 17 year old an 18 year old, or with small things like not having English dub performers say Japanese honorifics, although that last one is slowly becoming not a thing. But with these Yakuza 0 localizers, they were very focused on essentially just having these games be identical to their Japanese counterparts, only in English. But it was more than just translating, it was adapting certain Japanese nizisms in a way that would fit what characters were still saying or talking about so that someone with no knowledge on Japan could still understand what was going on. There were practically no moments of things like the subtitles being way longer than the two words a character said, for example, although there were some times where something was actually changed between versions, but rather than just simply changing them, they actually ended up improving them. It might be making things like a line that someone says more impactful or correcting certain mistakes, or in Yakuza 5 Remastered, it was thanks to the localizers that in the random ass Haruka comedy minigame, the little banana that shows up to aid with timing was added to the game, as originally it was only available to developers, but then the localizers basically said that's cringe, and so they added it into the full version of the game. The localizers back then and still today do a lot more than just translating the games, and thankfully they don't Americanize them either. They aren't doing just the bare minimum to push out the game so that they can go on to working on the next one, and because of that, there have been many times throughout the short years where the localizers have been put under intense stress to even get these things out the door, but it's not because of heavy workloads given to them by Sega of Japan, well, it, it is partially, but the main reason why is because these people want you, the player, to have as much fun as possible. And like with a good joke, the best way to enjoy it is if you understand it. They set these unreasonably high standards and expectations for themselves, and I am very grateful that they do. In a recent example of that, there are plenty of stories of their triumphs and failures out there on the internet, but again, a recent one that comes to mind is one talking about the difficulty surrounding the localization of Ishin, which Sam Mullen shared on his Twitter around the time of the remake's release. And then within that story lies another thing that I like about all these people. They're very honest and transparent, and even if their higher-ups don't like that, it's something that consumers could always use more of. Now, obviously, the people that physically make the game are the most important people, because without them, there would be nothing to localize. And thanks to these people that physically make the games, we get great titles like Yakuza 0. Zero is thrilling. It's exciting, it's dramatic, it's action-packed, but it's also heartwarming, it's sad, it's funny. It truly is cinema in video game form. But without good old Atlas taking great strides in conveying those elements in a way that an English speaker could experience it without any issues, then I definitely wouldn't be able to tell you how good it is, because I wouldn't have bloody understood it. I know a lot more Japanese than I let on, but for someone like me who obviously speaks English, I cannot even begin to express my gratitude to the talented, 
ever-evolving team of individuals responsible for writing this line in Like a Dragon Asian because that shit made me laugh so hard. So all in all, while I still have a few gripes with the combat of Yakuza 0, this is easily one of the best and most influential games in the series. You could argue that some of the games are better in certain aspects, but as a package and a piece of history, no Yakuza game will ever come close to impacting the world as much as Yakuza 0 did. Now then, I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, you should definitely do all the things YouTubers tell you to do, and I hope you'll join me for the next video where I'll look at the first remake of the Yakuza series, being Yakuza Kiwami.